I had recently graduated from an Ivy League university and corporate headhunters were swarming around me. They were promising me big bucks with all the health plan trimmings. They were talking about unique opportunities with market leaders in careers that most people could only dream of. All I had to do was sign up with them. The problem was, everything they were trying to sell me left me cold. I wanted something different but for the life of me, I didn't know what that was. And then the agency got in touch with me. I was in a cafe on my 10th coffee of the day, staring at the screen of my laptop and no longer really seeing anything, when a woman sat down opposite me. I had no idea who she was. She was in her 40s and had short, dark hair. A scar ran the length of one of her cheeks. I was trying not to stare at it when she said, In five minutes, a car is going to pull up outside, and you have a choice. You can stay here and from everything I know about you, go on to have a very successful life. But if you do that, you'll always be wondering, what if? Where would the car have taken me? What could my life have been? If only I had taken a chance and stepped into the unknown. As I sat there listening, my pulse began to raise. My skin was tingling all over. And for the first time in my safe, privileged life, I felt truly alive. A car pulled up, a perfectly ordinary looking car with a perfectly ordinary looking man in the driver's seat. I went for it. I took the chance. As the car left my hometown, a ripple of doubt passed through me, but that was all. My parents were divorced and distant from me in every way, and I realized that I had no friends that I would miss. I was 22 and free and had done something completely crazy. It was all that I could do not to holler with joy. Instead, I put on a poker face and watched the world as slipping by. The driver turned the radio on, a country and western station, which wasn't my style but I didn't object. It was seriously hot outside, and looking like it was only getting hotter as the buildings thinned out and we headed into open land. Soon, withered trees, the occasional run-down diner, and the skeletons of broken-down trucks were the only things between us and the horizon. The air conditioner was on in the car, its quiet rattle accompanied the music. Every now and then the signal would cut out as we entered a dead zone for reception, but then the music crackled back, and the singers were still lonesome and blue. When after a couple of more hours, the car pulled up at what looked like a derelict gas station. I guessed it was because the driver wanted to take a comfort break. The restroom in the station would be grim, but maybe to the driver it was better than going in the middle of nowhere. He turned off the engine. The air conditioner rattled one last time, and a slide guitar was cut off in its prime. And then the ground beneath us gave way and we began to descend. I whistled softly through my teeth. We were in the shaft of an oversized elevator, and after about 30 seconds, we had reached the end of the line. Doors opened in front of us, and the driver told me to disembark. It was the first thing that he had said to me. I stepped out into an open space to be met by a waft of pleasingly cooled air. This space looked to have been hewn out of rock to create an underground chamber. Another woman was standing there. She had no visible scars, but she did have a clipboard. Very retro, I thought, as she held it out in front of me with one hand and offered me a pen with the other. There was a single sheet of paper attached to the board, with a tightly packed text and a small font on it. What does it say? I asked. That you will keep everything that happens to you from now on a secret, she replied. I signed on the dotted line and asked, What's next? Is there a medical? So you can check if I'm up to scratch physically. She shook her head. There's no need. Your personal medical records were accessed and evaluated before you were approached. You've also been under constant observation for the last month. We know everything that we need to know about you. My poker face wavered but held firm. Now, she said, I'll show you to the training center. The next eight weeks were painful. 
For 16 hours a day, I was subjected to an intensive fitness program. The weights and the squats and the contortions that had no name I knew of blurred into one. My muscles were screaming at me to stop, but I would not. For light relief, I was plunged into ice baths and pummeled on a massage table. I was fed a flavorless gunk and I passed out rather than going to sleep. I also had no mobile phone, no access to the internet, no contact with the outside world. It was harsh and I did my best to suck it up. Then, after two months underground, I began learning different methods of combat. A dizzying combination of sophisticated martial arts taught by life, hard-looking men and women. Apart from one instructor, who looked like he had spent the last decade in an all-you-can-eat buffet, he taught me how to brawl with no rules and no move too dirty. I grew to like him. I never found out his name, though, or anything personal about him. Everyone who put me through my paces was strictly business. That was the way of the agency. I heard it called that by an instructor a few days into my training, and I never heard it called anything else as my training had progressed. That was fine by me. I assumed more would become clear in the near future, and I was not disappointed. I had showered in the minuscule bathroom attached to my sleeping quarters and had made my way to the training center. The woman who had met me on my first day was waiting for me. She said, You finished your basic training and today we're going to explain what you'll be doing for us. That was it. She was all about the business. I followed her along a corridor that I had never been down. Like my sleeping quarters in the training center, it looked to have been hewn out of the rock which surrounded us. Apart from lights that fitted overhead, there were no adornments. We walked for about 20 minutes until the corridor opened up into a vast area. Once again, my poker face was challenged. Everywhere that I looked, equipment was stacked from floor to ceiling. Monitors, keyboards, hard drives, blinking lights. Wires and reams of printed out paper hummed in word and cluttered. And people wearing white lab coats moved about, peering up at screens and pressing buttons. Some were deep in conversation, others looked lost in their own mental space. The phrase that sprung to mind was Nerd Central. It looked like somebody had dumped the contents of a hundred bargain basement computer stores into a big hole in the ground, added dozens of scientists from Central Casting, and jumbled the whole thing together. It was impressive but also chaotic. An impression that was reinforced by the sight of a golf buggy trundling slowly towards us. Its driver had a shock of white hair and wore a brightly colored checked waistcoat under his own lab coat. He came to a halt just before I was about to move my toes out of the way and chuckled. Welcome to the action. He said, got out of the buggy and shook my hand. This, he said, is the information gathering and processing hub. It's taken decades to construct and while we're still fine-tuning one or two things, I would say that we have created an eighth wonder of the world here. His eyes started to glaze over, but then he snapped back into focus. We collate information about economic, political, social, and meteorological trends and much more. Birth rates and death rates, CO2 emissions, changes in bird migration patterns, debt levels, droughts and floods, and TV viewing patterns are just some of the facts that we handle. Our remit is as broad as the world of today is splintered into countless conflicting issues. We have information that is available to academics and scientists and other institutions, but what gives us the edge is that we also have access to data gathered more, shall we say discreetly, through phone taps, surveillance, access to private and corporate bank accounts and the like. Our purpose in doing all of this is to monitor and understand the threats facing our civilization. We're collectively destroying ourselves, you see, inching closer to global destruction. Our work here gives us razor-sharp clarity on the state of play. He took a deep breath. For all its doom and gloom, I got the feeling that he rather enjoyed giving his little speech. Though this wasn't at all news to me. I think I've heard of this. I said. It's called the Doomsday Clock, isn't it? White hair didn't look impressed, and I immediately regretted opening my mouth. 
You were on completely the wrong track, he said. The doomsday clock of which you speak is a limited exercise in public relations. It's a navel gazing and will never achieve anything. Here, you see all around you the real doomsday clock. The mechanism by which the truth is revealed to us. And we don't put out press releases about this. We take measures to counteract the threats. And each time we do, we can push the hands of the clock back. We move humanity a little further away from complete catastrophe. We are, in short, saving the world one moment at a time. That struck a chord with me. This was out there excitement. Now, he went on, it's time for you to find out where you fit into this. Please follow me and all will become clear. Saying this, he hopped back onto his golf buggy, turned the on switch and whirled slowly away. I looked around at the woman, but at some point she had left, so I set off after the golf buggy on my own. I caught up with it as white hair was parking up in front of a huge screen. This was showing images of the inside of a shopping mall. I recognized a number of well-known outlets but could not have placed where the mall was. It could have been in any city in the country. There were no people in sight, so I figured wherever this was, it was after hours. White hair was staring up at the screen and did not look away as he spoke. This is where you will come in once your training is completed. You see, it's not just a man-made threats or one posed by the natural world that are edging us closer to annihilation. There is also the threat posed by the unnatural world, by the monsters which stalk this earth. Their presence causes danger and instability in the more hideous creatures that roam free, the more danger that we all are in of entering an endless apocalypse. So, it is of vital importance that monsters, wherever they're found, are eliminated so that the hands of the clock can be pushed back. And there are monsters all around us. His voice trailed off as a man appeared in one corner of the screen. He moved unsteadily, shuffling forwards. His shoulders were hunched, his arms dangled by his side, his mouth hung open. There was a speaker running the length of the base of the screen, but there was no volume accompanying the images, so I couldn't hear what he was saying. As he moved closer to the camera, his face came fully into focus. I forgot about the scene being on mute. His skin was drained of color and his features were contorted into an expression of rage that made me think of a rabid animal. He was out of control, a cauldron of anger. And he was not alone. More men and women all acting in the same warped way were coming into view. What are they? I asked in a shaky voice. Still not taking his eyes off the screen, white hair replied, Zombies. A threat that multiplies rapidly and exponentially, as long as they find somebody to bite it in fact. Luckily the mall is empty, but they cannot be allowed to leave. And suddenly the view changed. It must have been a different camera. We were looking at one of the zombies, face on and in close up. A red dot appeared in his forehead and then, quick as a flash, he was falling backwards, his arms flailing. Another man shuffled into view, and once again a point of red light fell into his forehead. Just as quick, he was falling. It was a sniper, I knew. Somebody was taking them out. The view switched back to a wider perspective and one by one they were taken out. I was standing there shocked by what I had just witnessed. When a distorted voice came from the speaker, the targets have been eliminated. You can push back the clock. White hair nodded and moved to a console to one side of the screen and then got busy tapping keys. He seemed to forget about me after this, so I made my own way back to the training center where I was presented with a new program to immerse myself in. I poured over manuals on myths and legends and accompanying volumes explaining what was true. And what elaboration. I studied grimoires and codices whose ancient vellum pages were bound in thick leather volumes, marked with bizarre symbols. I watched recordings of terrified eyewitnesses, some of who wore stray jackets, while others who were in military uniforms. Another mon that passed in this way, until I was thoroughly versed in the monsters that I might face once I was in the field.
As a sideline to my academic studies, I was also trained in the use of a number of archaic weapons that would be required for dispatching my foes. And finally, my training was complete and I found myself ascending the lift to be met by a perfectly ordinary looking car parked up by the derelict gas station. I had been told that I was going to be stationed at a hot spot and I was driven back through the desert. Just before dusk, we had entered a city. Sirens rose and fell all around me as we moved through a maze of streets until we arrived at a small nondescript office block. A man was waiting for me on the sidewalk. He was older than me by at least a decade and the top of his left ear was missing. He wore a cheap pinstriped suit and trainers and smelled as though he bathed in deodorant. I'm your partner, he said. He had a southern accent and the words came out slow and easy. His phone buzzing in his pocket added an urgency to things. He checked the screen and, and then looked at me. It's time, he said, for your first assignment. I smiled. I couldn't help myself. This is what I had been training for. My pulse was racing with anticipation as, minutes later, we sped in his car towards the alleyway. Our target had been picked up entering the alleyway by one of the thousands of cameras which monitored the city. This had set off an alert, and we were now arriving at the scene. It was a blisteringly hot night, and I was already wiping sweat on my eyes as I stepped out of the car and entered the alleyway alongside my partner. Trash lay everywhere, glass cracked underfoot and clouds of flies and gathered over rotting waste, brushed against our skin as we moved through them. To our left, there is a body, a man dressed in rags, a line on his front. My partner told me to cover him and then approached and turned the body onto its back. Despite the heat, a chill had settled over me. The front of the body was covered in bite marks, and its eyes were open and I could see the terror in them. My hands started to tremble, and I clenched them into fists to try and hide this while my partner indicated that we should move on. We left the body where it was and continued our pursuit. The only light in the alleyway bled in from the full moon high above us. I was taking deep breaths while trying to calm myself. My partner was slightly ahead and to my right. He raised a hand and I paused and then I saw it. In the gloom, a dozen feet in front of me, my guts tightened. The wolf stared at us, its dark eyes blazing with anger. Blood speckled the fur around its snout and as its mouth drew back into a snarl, I could see more blood staining its fangs. Its back was arched also and its claws extended. It had just killed the man in the alleyway and it looked to me like it was ready to kill again. I turned to glance at my partner, knowing that I needed to take my lead from him if I was going to survive this encounter. To my amazement, he smiled at the wolf and then said, Not much meat on your last meal, eh boy? There's slim pickings around here when the poor folks live. You should come with me, I can get you a nice juicy steak. Just a dripping crimson and still warm, the way you wear freaks like it. He reached into his jacket as he spoke where he carried silver that could end the wolf and the curse. And with a swift and smooth movement, he drew and the alleyway was filled with noise, and the wolf was falling and howling and twisting, and its paws were clawing in the air. Only now they were fingers and it was a man whose face was contorted in agony. A man who grew still, and then lay unmoving on the ground. The smile that left my partner's face, he spoke into his phone. The target's been eliminated. You can push the clock back. After this first assignment, the encounters with monsters came thick and fast. In less than a year, I completed 89 assignments. And in the blink of an eye, assignment number 90 was in progress. We were driving at speed towards a warehouse. It was located close to the docks. Not so long ago, this had been a neglected, crime-ridden area but now it was being transformed into a trendy place to live and work. Art studios and bistros were popping up everywhere, and once derelict buildings were being converted into expensive apartments. The warehouse was a prime location for the property developers. Only it had appeared from the camera footage that had brought us there that there was already a resident in place, an undesirable, 
I reviewed the footage on my phone. A dark shape had swooped into view before it disappearing into a broken window. It was larger than any bird of prey and much more deadly. We parked by a sign saying that premises guarded 24 hours a day, and within minutes another vehicle appeared. Its paint job resembled a police cruiser and the men who climbed out were probably ex-cops. Their guts hung over their belts now and a sweat shone on their flabby faces. My partner smiled his most charming smile and held out his ID. It was fake. It said that we were from pest control at the city council. You got yourselves an infestation here, boys, he drawled. But it's nothing for you to concern yourself with. Taking care of the critters is our specialty. These security officers did not even bother checking the ID closely. They were clearly happy that they could get back in their car and drive off without having to do anything more. Left on our own outside the warehouse, we took the equipment that we would need from the trunk of the car and headed inside. Dawn was breaking, but the light had yet to creep into the warehouse. It was a shell, still waiting for the builders to move in. Our target was nestled in the corner asleep. We approached as stealthily as possible. The crossbow that I carried could fire a wooden stake at velocity, but the accuracy over distance was not the best. Closer was better. And soon, we were at an optimum distance and the target had not stirred. Its wings were folded over its head and torso. Only the pale skin of its legs and feet were visible. This was an issue. The stake needed to penetrate the heart. My partner checked and I was ready and then yelled, Rise and shine. The vampire's wings flew open and it shot to its feet. Its face was a hideous mix of human and bat and it was completely hairless. It was one ugly son of a gun. And now its mouth was curling up into a snarl, revealing sharp, vicious looking teeth. Now I released the trigger and my aim was true. Before I had even drawn my next breath, the vampire had started to break down into dust. Job done, I thought, until something struck my partner and sent him crashing into the wall. I took out a new stake, and he tumbled around on the floor, trying desperately to defend himself from the vampire, which had come out of nowhere and attacked him. We hadn't seen it when we had entered and assumed there was only one target, a stupid mistake, and possibly the last one that my partner would ever make. I raised my crossbow. He was entangled with the vampire, whose fangs were inches away from his neck, which meant that I didn't have a clean shot and I risked fatally injuring him. But he was dead in seconds anyway if I didn't act. Thankfully, an opportunity had presented itself when they rolled in front of one of the broken windows. I threw myself at both of them. My momentum carried the three of us through the window, and we landed with a jolt on the ground outside. The vampire rose to its full height, its wings outstretched, and then screamed, ready to finish us off. But its bloodlust had clouded its thoughts, and we watched as the light of the early morning sun had caught its skin, and the smoke began to rise. The vampire screamed again, but this time in shock and pain. It was burning. The stench of its flesh as it was consumed by the daylight was nauseating and we both covered our mouth and noses as the vampire collapsed to its knees and then fell. Soon there was nothing left but ashes. I swallowed down bile and called it in. Another battle had been won, but the war continued relentlessly. Within a few more months, I was already closing in on my 200th assignment. I felt like a veteran by then. I had some seriously cool scars and sometimes I woke up screaming in the night. But I lived in a penthouse apartment by now, so that wasn't too much of a problem for the neighbors. The latest alert had brought us to a subway station. The commuters around us paid no attention to my partner and me as we descended the steps into the subway. The target had been picked up by a camera on the edge of a public area. It was making its way along the tracks, heading to an old part of the subway. We located a service door, broke the lock open, and made our way along an access corridor before emerging onto a platform that was no longer used. It was silent and dark until a train rattled past along a nearby line that was still active. 
Lights from the train flashed through a steel mesh fence, separating the old line from the new, and illuminated the platform on which we stood. The graffiti was faded, and the turnstiles rusted. Pages from an old newspaper lay on the track, just a few feet away from me, and something moved. There, I whispered, and pointed at the disused tracks where they had entered a tunnel. My partner jumped on off the platform and onto the tracks. The current no longer ran here, so it was safe. As far as not being electrocuted or run over by a train went, though, different dangers awaited for us down the line. We walked in a single file, my partner taking the lead. He was sweeping the beam of the torch on his phone along the tracks in front of him. Otherwise, we would have been moving blind. We weren't worried about this losing us any element of surprise. The target that we were pursuing sensed the world through vibration, and it must have already known that we were coming. We had been walking for a couple of minutes when my partner came to a halt and muttered, It's a family reunion. And I peered over his shoulder. Even after all the assignments that I'd been on, I was still not immune to shock or fear. This was a good thing. It helped keep me alive. And at that moment in time, I needed all the help that I could get. The tunnel in front of us was crawling with hundreds of giant cockroaches. The target had picked up by the camera had been around five feet long. The freaks of nature confronting us varied in size, but they were all equally hideous. The agency believed they were the result of the toxicity flowing through the sewers and the gutters and falling in the rain itself. Chemicals that would have harmed some creatures, but not the good old boy that was the city cockroach. They had bulked up on the filth. My partner spat on the ground at his feet and muttered, I hate bugs. And then he turned tail and he ran. We had not been anticipating this many mutant roaches and a head-on attack by just the two of us was out of the question. So I assumed as I raced to catch up with my partner that he had a new plan. And glancing back at the tide of cockroaches now chasing us, I very much hoped that he did. He was speaking on his phone, yelling that he wanted cooperation, not question. Due to our covert nature, the agency could not pull ranks over other official bodies, but our many aliases could be called into play. Whoever my partner was claiming to be, he was clearly kicking some bureaucratic butts into action. When we had reached the abandoned stop, he did not clamber back up onto the platform but kept running. Heading, I realized with alarm, I straight for where the tracks became live again. The 660 volts of electricity flowing through the third central track, it would fry a good few bugs. It would also kill the both of us instantly. My partner was showing no signs of slowing though. I glanced back over my shoulder. Neither were the roaches. They were crawling over each other and clambering up the sides and out of the ceiling of the tunnel. If they caught up to us, we would be completely covered in bugs. They would crush and suffocate the life out of us. I ran faster. Eventually, I caught up with my partner. He pointed ahead at a stationary train and said, in between gaps for breath. I ordered an empty train to be brought here pronto and for the power to be turned off for long enough for us to make it on board. The driver is bailed up but left the door open for us. But come on, hurry. I didn't hesitate. The first of the roaches were within inches of my feet. We sprinted towards the train and clambered on board, and then ran the length of the train. The roaches followed and soon they were filling the train. An unstoppable rush of grotesque bugs. We reached the driver's cab at the far end of the train and, with us both inside, my partner slammed the door shut. Uh, that'll hold him long enough, he said. Now, how do you drive one of these things? I answered by frantically pushing buttons until I got the train started and we began to move, taking our mutant passengers along with us. The train rattled forward past platforms packed with commuters who were too busy looking at their phones to notice that it was packed full of giant cockroaches. Then we followed the curve of the track into a siding where other empty trains were pulled up, waiting for maintenance and cleaning. We screeched to a halt and my partner led the way out of a hatch in the front of the train, where we jumped back onto the safety of a platform. A stairway in front of us took us back upwards towards the surface. What now? I called. There's gonna be an explosion, 
he said. The only damage will be to a number of empty trains. At least that's what it'll say in the news. I couldn't see his face, but I could imagine the smile there. The bugs were going to be obliterated and once more the clock would be pushed back. When we reached street level and were standing with our hands on our knees trying to catch our breath, as the sound of an explosion reverberated below us. Job's done, I thought. And then both our phones buzzed. A target had been identified on another section of the subway. The closest entrance was a quarter mile dash away. When we got there, people were pouring up out of the subway. Presumably the officials who ran the system were evacuating as a precaution. Following the explosion, our shady colleagues in the agency had just caused. We pushed our ways through and descended back into the subway. There was a train at the platform and only one commuter still on board. Our target. A camera had picked them up as they had fluctuated in size, their entire body bloating and then deflating. Very much not natural behavior. We stepped onto the train. I took out a fake ID. Ticket inspector, I said. When the commuter looked at me. He was incandescent with rage. That much was clear from his expression. It's a disgrace, he said, his voice shaking with anger. I pay my taxes and the rip-off ticket prices so I can get to work on time. But am I ever on time? No. Because of this lousy, incompetent, corrupt service. As his tirade built, I could see his body start to swell. His skin was rippling as well. There seemed to be a tremendous pressure building inside him. And it looked like something was about to give. His head was the first to go. It split open in a line beginning at his chin and running up to his scalp to reveal the monster which waited within. It was covered in reptilian-like scales and as it shrugged to free of the covering of human skin, it towered over my partner and me. Its mouth bristled with obscenely sharp teeth from which drool dripped and it was roaring. My partner swore. Ah, first bugs and now a shapeshifter. How many mirrors do you break with your ugly face this morning? He was actually grinning as he looked at me and said this. I tried to think of something snappy to say back. Big mistake. I had taken my eye off the ball and for a second, but that was all it took for the shapeshifter to lash out at me with one of its scaly arms. I felt pain explode in my guts where its blow connected and then watched a light show play out in my head against a background of darkness which spread until there was nothing else. I came round in intensive care. I hadn't known it was possible to feel so much pain. It was more than I could bear, but lying there with tubes sticking out of me and connected up to machines monitoring my vital signs, I had no choice. I begged for my meds to be opt, but I was told that any more painkillers than I was already being given would be fatal for me. The time was all messed up in my trash state and I don't know whether it was a few days or a few weeks later that my partner had visited. He looked sad. I managed to tell him that things weren't as bad as they had looked. The effort of speaking cost me a whole lot of pain, but it was worth it, as it brought a wiry smile to his face. And I prepared myself for a new set of hurts and then asked him, What happened? Well, the shapeshifter happened, he replied. It hit you with all its strength, and then grabbed you and began to bang you against the side of the train again and again. I managed to stop it and I took it out for good, but you were badly broken up, and the medics weren't sure you'd pull through. The smile in his face had fallen away by now. It's not a problem, I said. As soon as I'm back on my feet, I'll be out there with you, saving the world one monster at a time. He didn't say anything, wouldn't look me in the eye and I knew something was very wrong. It turned out to be me. I had sustained multiple fractures and permanent damage to internal organs when the shapeshifter had attacked me. And while I would be able to live an independent life, I would never be able to go on assignment again. After six months in the hospital, I was discharged. There was a car waiting for me outside, driven by a stranger. He told me that he was taking me back to my hometown. The agency had deposited enough money in my account that I could move from there to anywhere I wanted and start afresh. But it was an excellent starting point, they believed. The driver relayed this information to me and finished by saying, 
A bit of home cooking and familiar sights will do you the world of good. I sat in silence as he drove me away from the life that I'd known before I was injured. The life that was all I wanted and took me back to nothingness. That was a year ago and I'm still in my hometown. I haven't reached out to anyone I used to know. I live in a near empty apartment and don't speak to other people. I unorder the few things I need online and have them left outside the door. In the day I scan the news channels and it's only at night that I leave the apartment. I move real slow and have no choice. I am in constant pain no matter how much I self-medicate. It still hurts as well the way the agency discarded me. They threw me aside like I was so much as garbage. That makes me angry and anger is good. It helps me keep going through the pain and the loneliness. I have to keep going because I know the truth. We're moments away from oblivion, but while the clock is ticking, there's still hope. So I walk the streets of this town hunting monsters. I fight alone.